Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in. Again, I am Kaylee Batesman, the Content Director at She Can Code, and today we are discussing opportunities and challenges AI presents in the health sector. Now, the emergence of AI in healthcare has completely reshaped the way we diagnose, treat, and monitor patients. Applications include finding new links between genetic codes, performing robot-assisted surgeries, improving medical imaging methods and personalizing treatment options to name just a few. However, the World Health Organization has recently called for a rigorous oversight to ensure that AI is used in safe, effective and ethical ways. Now, luckily, I've got the wonderful Aisha Iqbal, IEEE Senior Member and Engineering Trainer at the Advanced Manufacturing Trainer Centre with me today. And she's going to help me discuss the challenges and opportunities of AI in healthcare. Welcome, Aisha. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me on She Can Code. Thank you for, for taking the time out. Now, we've got a lot to address. Um, can we get started with a little bit of background about yourself, just to set the scene, please? Uh, this is Aisha Iqbal, and uh, I am a senior member of IEEE and engineering trainer at Advanced Manufacturing Training Center, which is a part of Manufacturing Technology Center in United Kingdom. And I basically hold a master's degree in electrical engineering, and I'm currently pursuing my PhD in electrical and electronics engineering as well uh, from the University of Glasgow. Uh, before joining uh, AMTC as an engineering trainer, I have been uh, working as a lecturer in a university for around nine years and at NFE college for around two years as well. So basically, I have around 12 years of experience in academics, and I have been involved in research as well. Uh, I have got nine publications, including four journals, three conferences, and uh, two book chapters as well. And I have been uh, visiting um, different universities as a judge in engineering project competitions as well. And I have been evaluating uh, the uh, as the master's thesis as external examiners and also have been uh, serving as a reviewer for many different conferences and journals. Amazing. And, I think that's definitely one of the most impressive backgrounds I've heard so far. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, uh, and last but not the least, I'm a very proud ambassador uh, for women in engineering and women in STEM. Incredible. And I, I suppose um, what I wanted to ask you about that is in the minute what you're doing, you're studying um, electrical engineering. What 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 happened there? How, how did you, uh, that's quite uh, niche. How, how did you end up moving in, in that area? And, and how are you finding that? Are, are, are you the only woman in that area? What is that like? Uh, no, there are actually like, uh, because I did my BSc and MSc in electrical engineering from Pakistan. So luckily in, in my country, there were uh, like quite a lot of women in this field. So when I joined, uh, when I started to choose engineering as my like field or uh, as the career or profession, and when I got admission into my degree in university, then there were quite a lot of women in that field. So it was not very unusual or difficult for me uh, to uh, carry on uh, in this profession. And uh, that's why like uh, there were quite a lot of job opportunities as well. And uh, that's why it was like quite easy for me uh, to get into this field. As uh, how I chose this field was uh, when I completed actually my A-levels, uh, which is actually called intermediate in my country. I was actually interested in quite a lot of uh, subjects uh, from my school and college level. Uh, that was biology, chemistry, physics, maths. So I liked all of the subjects equally well. So it was quite difficult for me to choose uh, which field uh, I should take up as profession or career because I liked literally everything. So, but finally I cho chose uh, or decided to choose for electrical engineering uh, because of my interest in physics and mathematics as well. So, and when I went into the university, when I got admission and I started my degree, uh, I realized that there were quite a lot of women in my engineering university in all different uh, types of engineering, be it mechanical, civil, or any type of engineering. Uh, 
So I think it was like uh, quite encouraging. Uh, and when I moved to UK, uh, then I saw uh, that there are different geographical trends and there is yeah. a geographical disparity in uh, like, you know, the number of women uh, who actually like, you know, take up STEM careers and who uh, get STEM education and continue their careers as well in that. So when I saw this disparity, uh, then I started digging deep into it and I started studying more about into it, why the trends are like that. And uh, that's why that's where I was like, you know, motivated to uh, become an ambassador for women in STEM or women engineering so that I can motivate uh, other females and I can be, you know, that symbol or uh, that inspiration uh, so that more uh, women can join this field in this part of the world as well. Yes, and that's great it's that, that you've experienced that because I, I have heard that before um, about Pakistan and how, you know, it's very equally split when it comes to um, girls taking up STEM subjects. So for you to have experienced that when you come to the UK and you think, what on, what on earth is the problem? Like, <laughs> you know, I, there, there isn't a stigma around it where I'm from. What on earth is the problem over here? But yes, as, as you have noticed, we do um, have an issue with encouraging more girls um, to take up, uh, you know, study in, in certain areas. Um, and it's fantastic that, that you have become an ambassador in that area um, to share your own experiences. Um, we have a lot to talk about today about AI in the health sector. Um, so uh, I would like to ask you, because artificial intelligence seems to be on everyone's lips at the minute, can we start with how, how has AI helped advance the health sector? Um, as all other fields of life, AI has tremendous potential when it comes to healthcare as well. And yeah. not only for early and accurate diagnosis of diseases, but also for the treatment and to develop AI assisted surgical robots as well. And AI has facilitated the development of advanced wearable technology as well and different medical devices that can actually monitor vital signs and they collect data on patients' health in real time. And these devices, like when coupled with AI algorithms, they enable remote patient monitoring and early detection of uh, potential health issues as well. And AI can also speed up drug discovery, research, and clinical trial processes, uh, which not only cuts down the time, but the cost as well. So before it used to take uh, almost 12 years, according to a research, uh, when a drug uh, starts to be like investigated or researched in the lab, and then when cl clinical trials are done, and when finally the testing is completed and it goes to uh, the patients. So, but because of AI, this time can be reduced, uh, you know, to a great extent. So that's why I think AI has a great potential in the healthcare sector uh, from many different aspects. Yes, definitely. I, and, and you mentioned they're the two biggest ones, time time and cost, which, you know, most um, businesses or sector are always looking to improve their ROI in those areas. But 12 years to, to get drugs through, um, it's, it's quite a commitment. So, yeah, anything that can be done there to reduce um, that time uh, if you don't have those resources and and on the the topic of resources um here in the UK the NHS is short staffed um, and resources are very stretched here um do you think could AI be the answer to some of these problems um AI can certainly be a solution to many of these problems uh, for example AI can be used to analyze x-ray images and mammograms that frees up radiologists to spend more time with patients or to screen greater number of people more quickly. And it's not only time saving, but it provides more accuracy as well. And in yeah. the same way, it can help clinicians read the brain scans more quickly. It shortens the time it takes for patients to be treated. And that's how you can give them a better quality of care. And it can also help supporting people in virtual wards who would otherwise be in hospital to receive the care and treatment they need in their own home or usual place of residence. 
So remote monitoring technologies such as applications and medical devices, mobile applications, etc., can also assess patients' health and care while they are being cared for at home. So I think if we use all these ways and we implement AI to perform all these uh, functions, I think uh, the sh short staff problem or the limited resources problem can be solved uh, to a great extent. Yes, definitely. And and I, I love as well, um, your attitude is very optimistic about how we can use AI and there's very you know positive, um, uh, the way that you talk about it is very positive. There is a lot of negative press at the minute about AI um, and obviously it does come with its challenges as well. You just touched upon something there about accuracy and at the minute I know a lot of people are wondering when they use AI, do you still, everything has to be checked by a human as well. There's still, there's, there's so much up in the air. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what are the challenges to AI in health sector? Obviously, it's quite a it's quite a touchy subject. It's quite a, you know you're dealing with people's health. You know, it's, it's, yeah. things have to be accurate. Um, so, uh, what do you think those challenges uh, are? Uh, yes, there are challenges because the widespread adoption of AI in uh, all other fields as well, but especially in healthcare, will take time and effort as well because definitely it's a sensitive uh, matter or it's because it's related to directly related to the patient's health and their lives uh, but if we Im implement ai carefully uh, then it can help us a lot as well because it has uh, quite a lot of promising features which which can improve uh, the quality of life and the healthcare sector in general. It can help to save lives. So I think it's important uh, that it is implemented with care. It is implemented or used, but with care and the challenges are tackled carefully. For example, the biggest challenges can be the accuracy of AI systems uh, in diagnosing and in, uh, for example, determining or prescribing personalized treatments or medicines. So accuracy is uh, obviously uh, a matter of concern. Then fairness and transparency, then data protection and uh, the security and privacy. And with the help of, uh, if you meet all these challenges uh, or if you overcome all these challenges, then obviously patient's trust can be uh, established as well. And the trust issue is not only on the patient side, it's also on the clinicians and practitioners side that how much they are able to trust the diagnosis, for example, done by an AI system. So I think if AI system is implemented with care, uh, these challenges can be overcome. There is a lack of skilled uh, workforce as well because AI systems are complicated. So as AI systems will spread more uh, in the coming years, which we are expecting, uh, there will be more skilled workforce prepared to use AI systems as well. So that problem will also be, uh, can also be overcome when you will have obviously more skilled workforce who know how to implement those systems and how to use those systems with care. Yes, I love the fact that you mentioned um, the patient's trust there because you're right and that needs to be built from, from all areas that did. It's not something that is done. Trust obviously is not built with words, it's built with action and um, whether or not a patient's trust what is being used um, is something that is going to take time to actually you know, prove that these things um, work. And as you said, just implementing them with care um, to, to ensure that that trust is built over time. I love the fact that you mentioned skills as well. It's something that comes up so often in the tech sector that you're always, the tech sector is just always seems to be looking for skills in the next area and a lot of jobs that, you know, a lot of the ladies on the podcast that we speak to, what they trained for at university, those skills they don't even use anymore and they're learning new skills and new skills. And um, I love the fact that you just, pointed that out a lot of the jobs that are, are going to appear in the future they don't even the skills don't even exist for that yet it's um it's a it's a fast-paced and fun industry to be a part of isn't it technology that you know we don't even we haven't even filled that that skill shortage just yet yeah <laughs> yeah that's true um, as we've mentioned already high income countries um are already benefited benefiting from uh, ai um 
But what about developing nations? Do you think AI can have an impact in countries um, who are resource poor and, and those that don't have access to healthcare um, uh, <clears throat> professionals? Do you think that that AI can, can help them in that area? Definitely. Uh, AI holds a tremendous promise for transforming the provision of healthcare services in resource poor settings as well. Uh, for example, medical expert systems can uh, support physicians in diagnosing patients and choosing the treatment plans as is done in like high income countries. So for some conditions, they can also act in place of a human expert if one is not readily available, which is often the case in poor communities. And AI is already being used to predict, model, and slow the spread of diseases in epidemic situations around the world, yeah. um, including in the resource poor settings as well. And for example, dengue fever is a vector-borne disease that has spread rapidly around the globe in recent years, and about half of the world's population is currently at risk because of that. Uh, but researchers have developed a machine learning tool to identify the weather and the land use patterns associated with the dengue fever transmission in uh, Manila, for example, and other places uh, and other countries which are uh, dealing with such epidemics uh, can also uh, employ AI or it can also be implemented to uh, predict or slow down or monitor the spread of the diseases like that. Amazing. Yes. Um, I think it, that's something I hadn't even thought of, just slowing the spread of disease. I, I, I think from that question, I was thinking, you know, um, health professionals within the country and how they work, almost similar to what you were talking about, about diagnosis and things like that. But hmm. obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, countries that, that don't have access to, to healthcare um, uh, compared to, you know, uh, um, other countries. Um, they have different challenges and different um, problems. And as you said, even just slowing uh, the progression of uh, the spread of disease um, uh, would be, uh, is, is such an important topic, um, especially true. since we've all just come out the other side of a pandemic as well. I'm sure it's exactly. on everyone's minds as to what happens if the next one breaks out. Um, yeah. Which is a thought we wouldn't have had a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's true. Um, again, that was a, a positive spin. There's lots of positive things that can happen um, with AI. Thankfully, um, as you just mentioned there, um, slowing the spread of disease uh, would be um, obviously a, a um, positive side to AI. Um, but there is some level of fear over the advancement of AI, um, whether it be the loss of jobs, um, that I've heard a few times on this podcast, um, or to machines taking over. I've also heard that one on this podcast too. Um, do you think people have a reason to worry about AI? Do you think those things would happen? Um, as we discussed um, earlier also about NHS being short-staffed with limited resources, AI can help solve many problems like these. And not only in healthcare, but also in other sectors, the fear is valid. The fear that people will lose their jobs or the machines are taking over. But again, what is needed is to implement AI in such a way that it can help humans, not replace them. Yes. So if we use it responsibly for helping and supporting us and for making things quicker and better and within ethical and regulat regulatory boundaries, I think there is no need to be fearful. Yes, and I feel in the tech sector, as we were talking about earlier, with skills, everything moves so fast. There's always that conversation of job losses because there's been advancements and somebody, you know, IT managers might feel like they're, they're you know, something has come along to really help them in their jobs, for instance, and yeah. they're not going to be needed. Um, but actually, it just frees up their time to do something else. It's not so much yeah. you lost your job. The, the same with AI, I think it's it's the same conversation. It's kind of, as you said, how to um, uh, how to help people not replace them um, and help them to do their, their jobs in a different way or to move them on to, um, you know, freeing up their time to do other things. Um, you were talking about that with radiologists, you know, kind of freeing up their time to be with the patient more. Exactly. Um, I, I definitely think it's the way that it's going to be 
pitched yes. because there is that fear yes. isn't there, at the minute. <laughs> exactly. So just like we talked about NHS being short staffed and limited resources. So it, if they employ AI, it means like uh, their time and cost and a lot of other things are being saved. And if you can do more accurate diagnosis, for example, if we are talking about healthcare, or if we are, can save patients' lives, then like what is better than that i mean there is a, like but but the thing is again that it should be implemented in such a way that it doesn't uh, result in the loss of jobs it, it should help us not replace us and when we will follow this rule that it should help us not replace us it means automatically we are not letting the machines take over as well so the second fear yeah. is also gone with the help of this rule that it should help us not replace us. And also just we, as we were talking uh, uh, through this, I just thought of um, about like pandemic COVID that as a result of COVID, obviously many people lost their lives as well. And because uh, of the economic recession, many people were laid off and they lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic as well. So, yes. but just like we discussed that AI can predict or slow down or control uh, epidemics and pandemics as well. So if AI had been like used, for example, if it had uh, developed that much by that time when COVID started, if we had used AI for controlling or uh, slowing down or limiting the pandemic or predicting it well before time, or we could do something about it, then as a result, we could save, uh, you know, people from being laid off from their jobs as well. So it's just how you implement it or how you, how you deal with it or how and where are you using it? So yeah. I think it's just about that. Uh, so because it could help uh, save your jobs or like save many lives as well, if we like had used to uh, predict the pandemic or to slow down or control it. So yes. I think it, there is another perspective to this as well. So instead of, I know that there is a lot of fear, but it's just uh, the, the responsibility is actually on those people who are actually implementing it or bringing it into different sectors or uh, that how they uh, implement it and where they implement it, that it should help us not replace us. Yes, and, and that ties nicely into what we were talking earlier about what you said implementing with care um, to, to gain that, that trust um, from, from the industry and from patients themselves. And how can healthcare authorities educate patients so that trust for AI can be developed? Um, as we discussed earlier, that uh, most of uh, the challenges are related to obviously accuracy as well if we talk about healthcare then obviously accuracy of diagnosis and the fairness and the transparency and data protection privacy and security of patients obviously data they are important and how you can build the trust uh, is like when you are implementing an ai system if you ensure that the system has undergone a rigorous testing regime and a clinically accepted level of accuracy has been determined and outputs are reviewed by a staff member if required the results of the diagnosis or uh, the scans uh, when they are read by ai systems uh, they should they can be reviewed uh, by a staff member if required and yeah. it is it is also important that you ensure that any processing is fair uh, the system is like sufficiently accurate and you understand how it uses the data and how the individuals would reasonably expect their data to be used. And people are informed where a decision has been made by an algorithm. And also like be open and honest and explain the purposes for using AI and be clear about what you are going to do with the patient's data. And uh, you can also inform people of any new uses of their personal data uh, just to ensure that their data is protected and is secure. And uh, if you just ensure that appropriate security measures are in place, I think by taking all these actions, uh, you can build patient's trust. 
Yes, definitely. Uh, you remind me of, um, I had a conversation on here uh, recently with a lawyer about AI and she was saying it is a minefield at the moment because things that you just said, just letting a, a patient, for instance, know that a decision was made by an algorithm, there are things yes. that, you know, if there is a problem in the future, um, it, you know, she she said the things that we're having to write into, you know, policies now and terms and conditions um, surrounding AI, um, you know, obviously it, the, it, the discussion has suddenly blown open of what to do, whether or not your results are then reviewed by a human, whether or not you you know that or not. Um, it's a very busy time for lawyers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> AI. <laughs> exactly. Um, the EU, uh, they're in the process of drawing up an Artificial Intelligence Act. Um, what are your thoughts on regulation? Is it needed? And to what degree do you think? Uh, yes, this act uh, actually establishes the obligations for providers as well as users, uh, depending upon the level of risk from AI. And the purpose of this act is actually to just to make sure that AI systems which are used in the EU are uh, safe, they are transparent, they are traceable, and they are uh, environmentally friendly as well. So in my opinion, it is a good step towards making AI systems safe and transparent and to ensure that AI activities are performed within regulatory framework and ethical boundaries. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, as we said, it is one of those things at the moment that is quite up in the air, um, but I think uh, it is needed. Um, and, and as you said, all of that will just feed into AI being implemented with care, which is definitely um, the, the main thing um, that people see as a positive and that they see all the good things that are going to come out of it, um, not the negative. Um, I just wanted to ask you quick before we finish, Aisha, I know a lot of our listeners are going to be thinking, um, I would love to go into career in AI and in this area, and I'm not quite sure how to get started or what to do. Do you have any advice for our women that are listening that are thinking, where do I get started? Or is there anything that you wish that you had been told before you started working in this area? Uh, there are a number of ways in which you can take it up as a career. Uh, for example, I was talking to someone the other day who has a master's degree in data science and AI. And I myself also studied a course on machine learning, which is actually the basis of artificial intelligence uh, in my PhD degree. So I think uh, there are several ways uh, if you start studying about machine learning and data sciences, which has close ties with electrical engineering and computer sciences as well. So uh, for example, if I did my, when I did my BSc electrical engineering degree, so I could take up a master's degree after that in data sciences and AI as well. So there are several different ways. Um, I think you can stay in touch with the latest updates in uh, AI as well. You can also uh, study on a higher or advanced level if you want to uh, learn about it. You can also uh, keep yourself up to date by studying different research papers and the current research work that is uh, going on by different researchers in this field. And if you want to take it up as a career, it's best to uh, do a qualification or a degree um, in uh, data sciences or like related to machine learning, deep learning and uh, artificial intelligence itself. Yeah, and get started there. Lovely. That is wonderful advice to end it on. Thank you so much. We're already out of time, Aisha. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure um, having you on here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me on She Can Code. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And so everybody listening, as always, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you again next time. <laughs>